Okay, a uh, very big welcome to Denbydale Amateur Radio Club this week and uh, to our guest speaker, Anthony Luska, K8ZT, who's returning to the club. Um, always a pleasure to see Anthony at our club. And when I was looking, as I do, through people we've had speaking in the past, uh, what presentations they've got that I haven't yet seen uh, and you haven't yet seen, I saw Anthony had this one on the 10 worst antennas. And um, I thought, this could be great fun. Um, we were just talking about it before we started. Um, and um, I was making the point that antennas provoke Im immense amounts of um, passion amongst people. Either people love a particular antenna or hate a particular antenna. Um, and um, so I was with, with slight bit of trepidation uh, looking forward to Anthony's presentation this evening. So, Anthony, I'm going to hand the microphone over to you and um, let you take it away. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. This presentation was originally for the Dayton Hamvention last, uh, April, last May. Uh, K3LR had asked me to do a presentation on antennas, and I was doing it with a number of people who are very well respected in their field. And I reminded Tim that I'm not a technical person like some of these people that was presenting. So I had to come up with a little bit different presentation than what everyone else was doing. So the key is it's not only the 10 worst antennas for amateur radio, it's how you can do better. My usual contact information and as usual there will be a number of links throughout the slideshow and i'll make sure that this is up at the end also but tiny.cc slash worst dash ant or you can shoot the qr code we'll get you access to today's presentation and all the links that are in it so let's jump right in the three worst antennas are really easy to classify. Number one, by far and away, is no antenna. I can guarantee that that is the worst antenna that you don't have. Uh, the second one is when you have all the good intentions and you bought that antenna, but it's still unassembled in the package, in storage. Or maybe you got around to assembling it, but you just haven't installed it yet. It doesn't count until the coax is connected. Number four is an antenna that's improperly assembled or is much too complicated to assemble. I have one of these right now sitting in the garage. It was from uh, a, a, a well-known importer and it looked very, very interesting to use for portable operations. It was a 40 through 10 meter uh, vertical with built-in counterpoise. And I started to assemble it. And typically when you get an antenna that has pieces of lumen that slide into each other, there's some sort of indication of where to start as far as length goes and then you might need to touch it up and tuning it this one unfortunately gave you nothing other than insert this into that and no idea of how long it should be so it's going to take a little bit of time to do this it wasn't a quick assembly as i hope so eventually i will get it assembled but right now it's just too complicated number five is an antenna that's improperly installed or you use poor feed line. You spend a, quite a bit of money to get the latest, greatest Yagi beam. You have a great tower, and then you go up in the attic and pull down some RG59 that was surplus at the time, and the squirrels have been enjoying the uh, coating on the outside of it since then, and you attach that. That's what, not what you need to do. So remember, an antenna is only as good as the entire system, and that includes the installation and the coax. Number six is an antenna that retires, requires a counterpoise without one. Now you notice I didn't say radials, I said counterpoise. Because almost every antenna has a counterpoise. It's just different for different kinds of antennas. So on a dipole, one side of the dipole is actually the counterpoise for that particular antenna. Now we often think of verticals, which are a single element sticking up in there, and often we put down ground radials as the counterpoises. But some antennas are advertised as verticals are advertised as requiring no radials. What they're not telling you is they still require a counterpoise, and that counterpoise might be in the form of aluminum elements that are attached to the antenna, like the uh, Cushcraft RX R7, or they may in fact be part of your coax so the coax may be the counterpoise in some cases excuse me one second telemarketer um, so it may be 
a counterpoise in the form of the coax being the other portion of it, or it may require you put down ground radials. Whatever the case is, there needs to be some counterpoise somewhere in the vast majority of antennas, and if there's supposed to be one that you're adding yourself and you don't add it, it's not going to work as well as it should. SWR is not a good indication that there's no counterpoise required. A lot of people put a vertical up and say, well, the SWR is fine. I don't need any radials. Well, the real uh, information is going to be from how effective the antenna works and whether you can make contacts with it. Number seven is no antenna for a desired band. A lot of times we might have an antenna for one band, but we don't have one or we don't have one that works for another well for another band. Now, sometimes you might be surprised to know that the antenna you have up may actually work on multiple bands. For example, typically 40 meter antennas work well on 15 meters. Uh, they, just the natural relationship of the two frequencies means that they tend to work. They might require a little bit of touch up with an antenna tuner. Also, sometimes we can feed our antenna differently and use it on different bands. If you have an 80 meter dipole up, for example, you might try tying both ends of the feed line together and feed it as a long wire antenna with an antenna tuner and possibly work, use it on 160. I had many years where I had a 10 meter beam up a three element Yagi with an antenna tuner, it worked just fine on six meters. So sometimes you might have an antenna that you don't realize you do for a band that you didn't think you had an antenna for. Number eight, we're getting a little bit esoteric now. That's when you have the wrong takeoff angle for a target geographic area. Before I dig into that a little bit, let's just talk about amateur radio. We are one of the few radio services that has more than one frequency. And it's especially rare to have more than one frequency on different bands. So we have the luxury of changing frequencies, uh, changing bands to be able to work different parts of the world at different times of the day during different propagation cycles. So we can quite often take care of this issue of reaching a specific geographic area by changing bands. But if we're not changing bands, sometimes it's important that our antenna has the proper takeoff angle. So if we put up a horizontal dipole at a very low height, what happens is that takeoff angle is almost straight up in the air. Now, sometimes we want that when we want to work close in people. This is referred to as an NVIS antenna, Near Vertical Incident Skywave, because everything is going pretty much straight up, coming back down very close to where you're at. This works great if you want to use 80 meters to talk to people, oh, a couple, uh, 25 or 50 or even 100 miles away. Quite often, if you have that antenna up at a proper height, the the propagation may shoot right over the head and skip over them. Another example of this is if you ever see contest stations where they have a 150 foot tower and they have three stack, three or five stacked 20 meter beams on it, you think, well, that's because they add them all up and they get all the gain. Well, that's one reason, but that's not the primary reason they do it. By choosing which of the th five antennas in the stack they use making different combinations they can actually change the effective takeoff angle to target specific parts of the world so sometimes not using five all five antennas or all three antennas is not is is actually better by using just one or two at the right height and getting the proper takeoff angle um, i will talk about something a little bit later but when i switched the antennas temporarily at the house here I found out that the antenna I was using had a really poor takeoff angle on 10 meters. It was good on other bands, but it was pretty much horrible on 10 meters. And it should have been better, but it wasn't because of some factors of the antenna. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Number nine, no backup antenna in a portable field operation. Nick and I were talking before everyone came here about forgetting certain things on field outings. So when I go out to operate in the field for any distance away from the home, I always make sure I have two antennas with me. Even if the second antenna is a really poor compromise antenna, it means that the first antenna completely fails, I will still have a backup so my trip out is not a complete waste. Also, quite often by having that second antenna with me, I can go address number eight because two different antennas may have different takeoff angles uh, and might match the propagation better that day for where I want to talk. There is a rule that's used, uh, a, a saying that's used quite often for different military groups called two is one and one is none. And I talk about that in my portable operations presentation. Again, when you see this type of font, 
if you click on it, it'll take you out to a resource. And that resource happens to be a presentation I did on portable and field operations. And in there, I talk about the whole concept of uh, one is none and uh, two is two is one and one is none. Uh, so having that second antenna may be very helpful. Number 10. The antenna was put up properly. You used the correct feed line. Everything has been working great for years, but you've never looked at it again. And now it's getting rather old in the teeth. Uh, some of the support structure may be damaged or, or failing. The coax may be full of water. Elements may be broken off. Your feed point coax may be actually not attached to your antenna any longer. I had a person not too far away from me about, oh, maybe two miles, three miles away, said, I can't get my FT8 to work properly, so can you connect to me? I said, okay, so we did, and we did barely make a contact, but it wasn't that great. And I, we, tried, we checked a bunch of things on all of his settings, and I talked him through a bunch of things. Nothing really worked. The next day, he told me, I went outside, and the coax was lying on the ground, but the dipole was still hanging in the air. So we had made a contact via his coax lying on the ground with no antenna attached, but that's only because we were close to each other. So an antenna that's ready to fall down soon, you need to take care of it and fix it up and keep it going. Now, when I did this in, in May of last year, I stopped at number 10, but I actually have number 11 now. Number 11 is an antenna that's crashed to the ground. Unfortunately, I added this slide after a big one-minute super strong wind gust August 25th, 2023 at 12.45 a.m. Brought down my tower beam and my wire slope are all in well, one fell swoop. And you can see it wasn't a typical failure. The wind was very strong. I think it actually took the beam on top and used it to torque the antenna because it actually twisted it. All three uh, sections were actually twisted and torn away from the bottom. The only reason why I didn't go flying down the road is there was a hazer unit at the top of this and that has a... Uh, stainless steel aircraft cable that runs down to the bottom and that's i think what kept the old antenna from flying down the street instead it just went over and broke the neighbor's less than one year old fence which they did not please them very much uh, but it missed his old shed which he hoped it would have taken out so this is my antenna disaster for the last year and now i am using only one antenna so let's talk about ways that we can make it better Number one, get at least one antenna up and working. You can always upgrade it later. A simple dipole or end fed wire can easily can be easy and inexpensive starting points. Take time to properly assemble the antenna according to the directions. Tuning the antenna. And when you tune an antenna, remember that tuning it on the ground may not be the same as when you put it up in the air or if you move it near other objects metallic objects may change the tuning so sometimes it will require multiple attempts to tuning the antenna keep it simple sam simple wire antennas single band antennas avoiding complex designs and avoiding severe compromises are good things for the person just starting out save those more complicated things for the people who already have some simple antennas up and are trying to improve their situation but if you don't have anything up get something simple up and here's probably one of the simplest antennas that we have. It's been around for many, many years. In this picture, I have some nice glass insulators here, but instead you can go to your local discount store and buy a plastic cutting board. You can cut it and make all three of these insulators, including a nice one for the center. I usually make a triangle shape so I can actually attach the coax physically to the center insulator and provide support for it. Simple wire, which I have in my junk box, in my garage, everywhere I turn around, there's always wire. I never throw, a wire, throw away any wire, so there's always wire available. Dipoles vary considerably in size by band. On six meters, a dipole is only about 4.7 feet on each side, so less than 10 feet. In other words, less than three meters of size on a six meter dipole. And as a matter of fact, if you look, think of each of these, they're basically about half of the band wavelength is the length in meters. So a 20 meter dipole would be about 10 meters long. So the very simple to make, I have two links here with information on putting together dipoles. Here's some examples of the insulator, insulators this particular person is made out of uh, found materials or purchased inexpensive materials. 
There's a second one here with a link to uh, information on your first dipole from Bob K0NR. And he talks about doing that. So information is there available in the links. Now, sometimes you don't have two supports. If you don't have two supports, you can put up one center support and then bring the two ends of the dipole down towards the ground in what we refer to as an inverted V installation. The inverted V installation also takes less horizontal space and uh, that one support means that you might be able to get up higher than you could get up two supports. It also provides some omnidirectional pattern to it. The dipole does have some directivity to it, but the, the inverted V has less, so it's more omnidirectional. Avoid severe compromises. One of the severe compromises we often do is we try and make the antenna a lot smaller. Skimping on support structure usually means lower height. The antenna may give a low SWR, but antenna efficiency and size matter more. The best way to think of the size issue is from the antenna's point of view. In receiving signals, if the antenna is physically larger, then it would intercept more RF energy, and therefore everything else being equal will have higher gain. So sometimes we try and do it by using little miracle type items, such as the miracle antenna, uh, which was this, this was originally called, but it's been refined in the Wokong 365 antenna, which covers everything from 80 meters up to 440 megahertz with a little, oh, maybe a one meter long extendable whip that comes out of it. We have two adjustments here to use, adjust the ductin so we can get a SWR of the soil, but does that mean it's going to be an efficient antenna? No, not at all. But does that mean you can't make contacts with it? Yes, I've made contacts with the antenna just the same as this. Matter of fact, mine only has one knob on it. And it's not as efficient by any means. But you can make a contact. But it's going to be a lot harder than that simple dipole antenna, which would have much better gain and much better uh, signal strength on receive. The other problem we run into, in addition to these miracles and black boxes, is the excessive superlatives that we see in antenna advertisements. Here's one from the Wet Noodle Antenna Company. If you can't read it, it says, random length of wire antenna, the best straight wire available, perfect for stringing between trees. It's accurate, easy to install, premium selectivity, optimized for ham radio by our unique process. It says you're 599, oh man, and actual product may vary. So we can pay a lot of money for just simple wire that we could buy We could buy much cheaper and make our own antenna. Sometimes you may have heard of the idea, or maybe some of you have done this in the past. You can use a light bulb as a dummy load. You simply uh, put power into it. It's dissipated by the light bulb, and you can even tune it for brightness. The problem is some of you may have done this and then had someone reply to your testing because they heard you because light bulbs will transmit and Dave Day put together a link and you can go out to it. He actually goes out and rates the quality of light bulbs and he has a group that has light bulb contests where they see how far they can they can transmit and how strong their signals are and he'll even tell you about the best type of light bulbs and how to optimize them and here's a map of his some of his signals with his light bulb on FT8 and FT4 as seen by PSK Reporter. These gentlemen, uh, VA3OSO and his accomplice, have a YouTube, and I'll let you watch the whole thing later, but I'll just start it up here. Let me put the sound on for a second. I forgot to put... Let me turn the volume up a little bit. Thing was, it can tune up we, we can't see the video now, Anthony. Oh, I'm sorry. This was three years ago. No, two years ago. I was thinking, if it can tune up anything, I can tune up anything. So that's what I'm going to do today. Try to do today. So we've got uh, the normal setup with some coax. So they're going to tune up this baseball backstop. And they're going to go on to tune up a number of things, including what they refer to as a wet noodle. The wet noodle really isn't a noodle. No, no, pos no pasta was harmed in this experiment. They actually used a piece of rope soaked in salt water so that they wouldn't fall apart. But they tuned up many things and made many contacts. So I'm not saying you can't do it with light bulbs, the Miracle Antenna, the wet noodle antenna, etc. But there's much easier ways and much more efficient ways.
Unfortunately, the antenna literature is filled with subjective and useless statements. I worked Slovenia with my first contact. He gave me a 5.9 with only 5 watts. It worked better than XYZ that I used last year. None of these provide any quantitative information. So let's talk about some other ways. If length is a problem, instead of making it shorter, figure out different ways to do it. And one is zigging and zagging. There's nothing that says that dipole has to run perfectly in a straight line. You can zig and zag. You can droop ends. There's a number of things you can do. It might compromise it a little bit, but still, you're going to have a much better antenna than our miracle antenna before. I already mentioned the inverted V, and by the way, this is not an inverted V. This is actually a delta loop, and I have two links here about information on loop antennas. And you can see that loop antennas can be a number of different types. They can be full wave. They can also be different shapes. They can also be different uh, ways that you configure the shape or orient the shape. And this article goes through a lot of information on that, but basically... This particular uh, in, uh, delta loop here is fed on the side, and it is fed with the it is arranged with the point at the top and the base horizontal. What this actually means is this antenna is vertically polarized by feeding it here with this configuration. If you have the loop in the the triangle and the other shape with the horizontal part at the top coming down to the point at the bottom, it's actually horizontally fed. What that means is you have to keep it up higher. In this vertical configuration, you can actually go with less than three meters of height at the bottom of it. Feeding it on the side here will give you a good vertical pattern, and this can be a very effective antenna. Second link actually talks about one from DJ Zero, where he builds one, uh, DJ, DJ Zero IP, he builds one for 40 meters, but you can scale this to any band you want. And it's a great uh, monoband loop antenna. Oh, the other advantage too of these, these types of loops, like the delta loop, is it only requires one support. Number seven, if possible, get your antenna outside. My first antenna was zigzagged through a, a, an attic of an uh, apartment that I lived in. Uh, it wasn't very effective, but it did work, but it worked much, much better when I got it outside. Matter of fact, my first antenna, which was a receive-only antenna, when, it was, when I was a teenager, I lived in the basement of my parents' house, and I built a three-tube regenerative receiver. Because I lived in the basement, I was able to staple up a piece of wire to the floor joist, floor joist above my head, so I actually had a basement antenna. When I convinced my parents that I wanted to run it outside, it was much better also. So getting the antenna outside can be very helpful. Keep it away from other objects and metal, and metal uh, other antennas and metal objects, and put it at or near its recommended height. For best results, most dipoles should be approximately a half wavelength or more above ground. That's very easy to do on 6 meters, but very difficult to do on 160 and 80 meters. That's why quite often 80 meter 160 antennas aren't vertical dipoles. They often are inverted L's or other types of vertical antennas. If the recommended height is impractical, think an inverted V with only one support, verticals with proper counterpoises and radials, or an inverted L where we go up and then over. A delta loop is another way to get around that. Now, we've been talking about HF for the most part, but let's talk a little bit about VHF and UHF. On VHF and UHF, line of, and other line of sight contacts, you want to make sure that the polarizations of both stations match. So to, by convention, on FM, we use vertical polarization. On single sideband digital, we use horizontal polarization. Remember, this is on VHF and UHF. It will greatly decrease your signal strength if you have the opposite polar polarization. But that doesn't mean you still can't make contacts. I only have a vertical on two meters, and I make single sideband and digital contacts on it, but I am losing some signal strength. I know that. Now, before you start worrying, it doesn't matter anytime you bounce it off the atmosphere whether you're vertically polarized and the other station is horizontally polarized. There is no need to match polarization because the atmosphere will effectively scatter things so there is no horizontal or vertical polarization uh, ability on the other end of the signal. So if it's going up and being uh, reflected by the atmosphere, all polarization doesn't matter. 
On VHF and UHF, probably one of the most important things is to get the antenna as high and in the clear as possible. As we keep going up in frequency up into the microwaves, uh, things such as foliage, tree leaves, even rain can be detrimental to the operation. Here's a simple ground plane vertical for two meters. And I have a whole section here on uh, VHF, UHF antenna options. There's one thing that almost everyone will agree on. The rubber duck is the worst antenna and the best antenna for a handheld radio. It is the best antenna from the fact that you won't pe poke people in the eyes and it's short enough that you can carry on your belt, but it's a really horrible antenna as far as ability to uh, send and receive signals. There's some ways you can fix, you can improve on it. One is called a tiger tail. That's putting a small uh, 19 inch uh, piece of wire at the base of the antenna that acts as a counterpoise for that. By the way, the counterpoise on your HT is your arm and the rest of your body, but by prying this little tiger tail, it makes a more effective counterpoise. We can also do things like do a home-built um, J-pole antenna. This flexible can be rolled up and put in your pocket, and I have a whole video on how to do that here on building a portable J-pole antenna. And I even found one that's all in millimeters and centimeters for you so that you're not playing around with uh, our crazy measurements here. This is also information on the tiger tail. Uh, this is a slide that I put together for beginner VHF, UHF uh, operators talking about the different types of options for VHF, UHF antennas. When we have an integrated situation like a rubber duck on a portable, uh, that's something we have to deal with. There are ways to make it a little bit better, but um, there's a number of different types of antennas you may have for different types of operations that might be much better. One thing you do need to remember on VHF and UHF though, the higher and further away you get your antenna from your radio, the more important it is to use quality coax because on the higher bands, coax loss is much higher than it is on the low frequency bands. So coax becomes utter, uh, very important. Also connectors become very important. And here's a number of VHF and UHF antenna options. Everything from an extended uh, rubber duck uh, to a foldable extendable rubber duct, to a log periodic that works on many frequencies, a simple little VHF uh, horizontal, I'm sorry, vertically polarized Yagi, uh, a set of cross um, 40 meter, I'm sorry, 440 and 2 meter antenna for satellite use, and a common fiberglass uh, covered antenna for vertical use on VHF and UHF. Antenna gain is an important factor. If you consider adding an antenna with gain, that means you're favoring some directions at the expense of others. There is no free lunch, so you are going to lose some power in some directions, but you want to aim it where you want to talk. So the gain means wasted signal in undesirable directions, uh, and it doesn't have to have a, be a beam to have gain. There's two things that were very important in, in, with our gain is where the gain is being pointed. So quite often we have different types of patterns and we typically want a more flat pattern as opposed to sending everything straight up in the air. Here's an example of four VHF, UHF antennas that all pretty much are identical except for the fact that they are small, bigger, bigger, biggest. Each has more gain than the other and a little more cost and a little more difficulty in installing it, but they all have their gain in a horizontal direction, shooting out of the antenna and not straight up in the air. And the higher, the longer you go, the more focused that will be. You can also add gain by adding multiple elements, such as a simple Yagi antenna. Those are very easy to do at 20 meters and up in frequency, but when you start going down to 40, 80, and 160, they become somewhat difficult because of the size. Uh, there's a station near me, K3LR. He has a stacked tower array of three 40-meter beams. Uh, rather large, and but very good. You can also build home-made uh, Yagis very easy. Another uh, method instead of a Yagi is to build a Moxon antenna where the ends are folded back. And I have a software calculator here to figure out the lengths if you want to build your own Moxons. Now, this is a guide that I put together a couple years ago during the pandemic for a local radio club. 
uh, they were going to operate field day, and all of a sudden they said, oh, I usually just show up at field day and the antenna's there, or I come out and help put the antennas up, and Frank always figures out where we're going to put up. So they were going to operate from home, and they needed some ideas, so I put this together, called it port antenna, because they were going to be portable antennas, and uh, you can get to the link from there. And I went through and compared different types of antennas, pros and cons, and some notes. And then I had sections on each type of antenna with links on resources, YouTube videos, uh, how-to uh, guides, and in some cases even commercial examples. So half-wave resonant, non-resonant dipoles, resonant, non-resonant, N-fed antennas, inverted Vs, wire loops, verticals, beams, stealth and indoor antennas, 10-meter antennas, 160 meter limited space, magnetic loop compact transmit antennas, integrated antennas, mobile antennas, VHF and UHF, and then some general antenna resources. Oh, by the way, I forgot there's also a list here of uh, some antenna charts for you with different lengths uh, of so you can figure out the lengths that you need. Some general resources. And the last one here is a link to a group called the Villages in Florida. And they have a number of restrictions on what they can put up because of their housing area. So they put together a guide to stealth antennas and they graded each one. So each antenna is graded on it's on air ability, it's stealthness, it's t whether it needs a tuner or not, how difficult it is to install it, cost, and then which bands it works well on. And they went through and did this for a number of different antennas, the flagpole antenna, the screwdriver antenna, and so forth. And they have a chart. This chart is available at the end here that shows you all the different grades for each of the different types of antennas that they do. So that's right here, this chart. Now this is my antenna farm. Here is the K3LR Contest and Emergency Operations Center in Western Pennsylvania, right along Interstate 80. We're going to take a look at all of the antennas at K3LR today. We're going on top of the 160 meter tower that is just in the bottom of the screen now. We're coming up on the two four squares. These are phase four squares for 80 meters and uh, each one of those verticals is about 75 feet tall. Here's the 40 meter tower and we're going to go on top of it uh, for the moment but we'll come back. That's the 40 meter y stacked Yagi's there. Unfortunately, and take that's not my antenna farm. That's about 60 miles to the east of me. That's K3LR. This is was my antenna farm before August 25th. I had a 50 foot tower. I had a, a, a Sumner XP508 log Yagi on top of it for uh, 20 through 6 meters, including all the work bands. I had an 80 meter sloper in one direction and a 160 meter sloper in another direction. I had a DX Engineering 43 foot vertical with an antenna tuner at the base back here. And I had a VHF UHF uh, Comet vertical right here on the roof. There's another picture of it. But unfortunately, it's not there. And now I'm limited to. I've moved my 43 foot vertical away from the trees out to the base of my antenna and I've been using that since last August. And with my five watts so far this year, I've worked 157 countries with the, with the vertical. So I'm doing a, a, a forced uh, review of the 43 foot vertical being it's the only antenna I have right now. But it has a really bad takeoff on 10 meters. So I actually have put up a small 10 meter vertical on the back of my fence back here on a, on a support pole. It's a little bit better than the 43 foot vertical is for the takeoff angle on 10 meters. Here's some resources on antennas, the number of them on antenna efficiency, rules of thumb, size and antenna efficiency, the, mess, the portable operation I mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, sometimes it's not the antenna's fault, and it's there's other things you need to work on. Uh, it's quite often the antenna's fault, but not always. The first one talks about techniques for making contacts. Uh, the second one talks about assessing your station using things like the reverse beacon network and remote online software defined receivers so you can listen to yourself. And this can really help you with antennas also because it can tell you which antennas work better and which directions they work in. And then a, one here, time, uh, tech, top secret techniques to work to all states in DXCC. If you're a beginner to HF operations, 
Uh, as you know, we did the, Dennis and I did this for your club. So this is the U.S. version. You want to use the U.K. version, which we did for Denby Dale last year. And there's also one on VHF and UHF I did with Marty Wool in 6VI. And that's the end. I'll leave this, the uh, QR code up here if you'd like to shoot that, or if you jot down this link, that'll give you access to the, all the links in the slideshow. I'll go ahead and take questions now. Yeah, super, Anthony. Thank you very much. And um, <laughs> you definitely avoided the um, uh, the, the problem of uh, starting a row about an antenna. Um, uh, yes, your video of uh, K3LR's um, incredible complex of antennas there shows why whenever there's any contest on, K3LR is absolutely the biggest station you can hear coming out of the States on any on any contest. Tim is really obsessive, and at, when you go inside the station, they have single band amplifiers for each station. They don't even trust multi band. It, Tim thinks anything that's multi band is not optimized. So he has single band amplifiers for each of the stations. They have dedicated stations for each of the bands. They have a dedicated backup station for each of the bands. Uh, it's unbelievable operation. I'm lucky enough to go there a couple times a year because I'm a member of that the club that uh, Tim is in and we have our picnic there. So it is a very interesting station. I it, I can always count on working them in a contest except for sometimes they're much too long for me to hear from here. Brilliant. Well, thank, thank you very much, Anthony. Right, who wants to go first with a question or comment to, uh, to Anthony about his uh, presentation tonight? And I will talk about specific antennas if you're interested, because you can't get to me because you're at a distance. <laughs> yeah, who wants to go first? Everyone's gone very quiet suddenly. <laughs> By the way, I'll just mention one thing about the G5RV just to kick us off. One of the problems is a lot of the people, a lot of the antennas that are referred to as G5RVs are not really G5RVs. If you go back and read the literature, the design parameters that were there in the original literature are very different today. And also the fact is it was not designed as a multiband antenna. It was designed as a 20 meter antenna originally and used a lot different feed system than most of the current ones do. Yeah, and, and the, the original antenna as built as well, Anthony, as you know, uh, had um, homemade feeder that fed it right the way from the center point to the antenna right down straight into the shack whereas yes. the ones that are now commercially sold have got a, a section of ribbon feeder going into a piece of coax and that completely changes the way in which that antenna works it because does the, the the homemade um feeder for it um the high impedance uh, feeder had was part of the operation of the antenna itself yes Oh, by the way, on that vertical that I talked about, that 43-foot vertical, I have a tuner at the base of it is what I'm using. So it uh, really is helpful in that respect to have an automatic antenna tuner at the base. Questions, comments, suggestions? All complaints go to Nick. I've got a few of those um, antennas. Go on, Rachel. <laughs> in boxes. <laughs> yes, that's number two. That's number two on the list. <laughs> It's it's better than number one, but it's still number two. So you need to get one of those out there and get them installed. So I actually the ten meter antenna I'm using right now because I said the forty three foot vertical is not that great is one that I wanted to ham fest about twenty five years ago or thirty years ago, and it sat in my garage with no need until I needed it. So sometimes having that antenna in the box can be good, but you do need to get it up if you actually want to use it. Here's oh, yeah. one for you, uh, Anthony. Yes. You say you use, you've got a home-made 43-foot vertical antenna. I know this one, um, and I know uh, the company that made it, I think, or, or does make them now, LDG, I think. They were taken over, weren't they, by DX Engineering. Now, a 43-foot vertical, um, and you've got a, an antenna tuning unit at the base of the antenna. 
with those type of 43 foot verticals, they usually have a four to one on on at the base. Correct. Do you do you have a four to one on on at the base? And then the antenna tuning unit to fine tune it. And and also part two of the question is, do you have a common mode choke somewhere in line? Okay, the first the first part of the answer is yes. I originally had a four to one unum at the base of it, and I found it worked better with the wide range antenna to remove it. So actually, it found I found that it was not productive. When I was using it before, I had the remote tuner at the base. I had the four to four the four to one. I was running a coax into the shack, and it was very helpful. So I my experience is if you're using an antenna at the base and it's a wide tuning antenna tuner the four to one is actually not beneficial. But if you're running a coax from the antenna to the shack and then running a tuner in the shack, the four to one seems to help significantly. Yep, I, I understand. I, I, yeah, I do not have a common mode choke uh, and I'm not getting a problem with feedback, but again, the antenna tuner is at the base of it. So I'm, my, it's, my coax line is seeing a 50, a 50 ohm load and it's getting a one to one match for the most part. Um, it tunes a 160. It gives me a, a one to two to one to five to a two to five, depending on what part of the band I'm in. There's a couple spots where it gets much more touchy, and it, it gives me a, a unacceptable SWR at some points. But it's still usable. It's nowhere good. It's nowhere near as good as my 160 sloper was. Um, the 160 sloper was a much much better antenna on 160. Uh, I've worked 75 countries with the 160 sloper with my five watts. On on the uh, the vertical, I'm pretty much limited to the eastern part of the United States and Canada. Occasionally, the Caribbean. It's it's not as good a performer by any means. And I knew that from years back when I had my. I originally had a butternut H, HF. I can't remember if it was a five or six multiband. And it was okay on some bands, but it wasn't great on the lower bands. And then I put an HF2V in, which was much better. It's just a dual bit, a two band vertical. It was much better on 40 and 80, but it was really bad on 160, even with extra loading coil. Um, the sloper was the solution to that. And when I put the sloper up, I finally started to be able to make contacts into the into Europe with uh, 80 meters and 60 with my five watts. Before that, with the verticals, I was never able to make those same contacts. So yes, it's it's. It's not as good as what I had by any means. As I said, it's a forced uh, testing of the antenna with 5 watts. And I've been pretty happy. On 20, 30, even 40, it works very well. It's, it's, it's weird on the higher bands because the takeoff angle is the biggest thing. It has a very poor takeoff angle on 10 meters. It's much too steep, so it's not a great 10 meter antenna. But it's a halfway decent 12 meter antenna. Not much difference in band, but it's a, a much better performer there. It's not bad on 17. It's not bad on 15. I am working a little bit more 40 meter stuff than I usually do distance wise because, well, the, the 43 foot vertical was my 40 meter go to antenna before, but now that it's out in the clear, it's a little bit better. Before it was a little too close to my aluminum siding on the house and to a chain link fence, so it was being detuned some by that. Now being on you know, a diff better spot in the yard, it's much better, but yeah, that's. Those are my answers. I hope that answered everything, Ken. Uh, yeah. The, the reason I asked you the question is because um, I think in the UK, I don't think many stations use 43-foot vertical antennas. And 43-foot uh, is not a big vertical in the, by any means. But to cover such a wide spectrum of, of, uh, of frequencies... I didn't know whether you would have used the four to one and the ATU at the base at this, you know, pretty close to each other. Yes. And that's why I asked it because mostly I see 43 foot verticals just fed via a four to one on on. Yeah. Um, yeah. And by the, what, by, go on, oh, sorry, carry on. I was just going to say, by their very nature, the 43 foot is chosen because it's not resonant on any of the frequencies. So when you're using a non-resonant antenna, you have to be sure that it's non-resonant all the bands you're going to be using it on. So there is a chart in that presentation I have in the 
the portable antenna section, there's a chart there that tells you different lengths that are not resonant on multiple bands. I also do a lot for portable operations. Quite often, I use an end fed uh, wire that I support with a seven meter fishing pole. And again, you want to find a non resonant length because if you have a resonant length, you're going to, it's not going to work on all the bands. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, you didn't mention magnetic loops. Yeah, Have you I, any I, experience with them or do you hate them? No, I have I have used them before, and one of the things that's really interesting about them, magnetic loops have a very, very narrow bandwidth. So anytime you QSY, you have to touch up the tuning on them. And without a, some of them have an automatic tuner that you can do from a distance, but otherwise you have to go in the field to tune it. You're, you're right in the antenna to tune, so you don't want to be doing it while the antenna is being operated. So you're constantly fiddling with it. Now, if you use a magnetic loop on FT8 and FT4, where you plop down on one frequency and you don't move often, they work wonderfully. So if you're stuck with a home situation where you have to put something on a balcony or you can only put something out temporarily and then have to bring it back in the house, a magnetic loop can be very, very useful if you're using fixed frequency type operations like FT8 and FT4. But if you're going to use it instead for like something like a CW contest where you're moving up and down the band or a phone contest where you're moving up and down the band, you're going to be chasing your tail constantly. So unless you are calling CQ all the time, which is probably not going to be easy to do with that because you're not going to have a dominant signal on the air, but it works great for FT8 and FT4. And I know a number yeah. of people that they have a balcony, they're in a multi-story facility and they have a balcony, they go out and clamp it on the balcony and it works as a great antenna. They are a little expensive, though, for what you get. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, there is a one seen, that's... A, I'm sorry, go ahead. Have you seen the antenna that almost looks like a bird feeder? It's yes. from the And I just wondered what your thoughts were on those. And do you agree that... I mean, my thoughts are that the, ver, the feed line is used as part of the antenna. But I don't I, know what, what they, I can't even remember the name of them. I know what so you're talking. Small. Yes, I know what you're talking about. And I actually have two out in my garden in the shed and uh, they have extremely narrow bandwidth. And I think the feed line is the most productive portion of them. They were called, oh, what was the name of them? Again, there's something that's a compromise because they're so small. I can't remember the name of the, the antenna. Does anyone remember what they were called? They had a metal plates on them for capacitance, and they had a lot of coils on them for inductance. Orbitron. Yes. Go, go ahead and say that again. They're Orbitrons. Orbitron? Uh, a induction oh. coil in the middle and... Uh, a couple of uh, capacitive plates, top and bottom, mm. uh, with a whole bunch of doohickeys on the side to adjust the resonance. That's it. They were they were made by the company called Bailal. Yes, that's right. I would class that as being the worst antenna ever. <laughs> But I have made contacts on one. That's the th again. That's the thing. This is what he's talking about. This is one of them right here. This is the forty meter antenna. They, I think they actually had a one sixty antenna. Yes, they did. They had a one sixty antenna that was uh, about oh, I'd say probably less than three foot in size. So they they were very tiny. But uh, this is their uh, this is these are their antennas. And as I said, I have two in the shed, but the fact that they're living in my shed means that I haven't had great results with them, or they would be out being used. Yeah, I do know another antenna that's comparable to those called the EH antenna, where they were a coil uh, and you was the feeder. E-H. I think they yeah, were made in Italy. Here's one of them right here. That's it. Not a very good picture, but that is it. 
Yeah. According to the critics, if this antenna works at all, it is because the coax is radiating, not because of the efficiency of the antenna. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's a number. There's a number of antennas, and and you know, unfortunately, we always want to take the easy way out, and that means that there's a lot of compromises in a lot of these antennas because it just seems if we can make it smaller i've always thought one of the nice things would be is if, if there was inflatable antennas that you know that could go up to like 65 feet you could just inflate a vertical and it would be you know stay up straight for you because the problem is always fighting gravity gravity is not the friend of antennas by their very nature because we want to keep them high and then we're fighting the wind so that inflatable antenna would probably only be usable when there was no wind at all. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, they've got something like that, haven't they? Yes. A mixture between a kite and a balloon-shaped uh, gizmo, which are the, the downside is that the helium is expensive, and uh, if you buy too big a one, you can't get it back down again because it's got too much lift. Yes. I uh, I worked, my neighbor for many years was, I had hot air balloons, so I worked with him with hot air balloons, and I'll tell you, it was so much fun when, to get up on two meters and just go up in the balloon, that makes it a lot easier, no matter what antenna you had, worked great. We had, a, we at that time, uh, he didn't have an amateur radio license, so we had to use C, uh, Citizens Band Radio, so I built a, a ZEP that we would hang out, and that ZEP on, on CB was just fabulous, on, you know, to, having that that long antenna up in the air but he had to bring it in before we came down or we would catch on everything so other questions Anthony, yeah. you mentioned um there's a slide you when you're talking about vhf uh, part of your presentation there were four verticals you showed yes yeah small larger and so on so you mentioned did you mention horizontal polarization, or did I get that wrong? No, the, I said that the, the, they focus the, the radiation in a horizontal uh, yeah, right. angle, so that it reduces the, it reduces the takeoff angle. A actually, the very interesting thing about those with the really high gain with the, the really high gain ones have almost a completely vertical pattern of radiation. To them, but they're not vertically, they're vertically polarized, but the energy is going out in a horizontal fashion. Yeah, I get you. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, just going, Andy, uh, go on, Andy. Yeah, go on. Just going back to when um, you were talking about verticals with Ken, uh, I, I built uh, one that Ken gave me an idea about, uh, and I've got 29 feet of wire vertically through a nine to one on, on uh, and then coax back to the shack. But I have, I have choke mine. I have got a choke on mine, uh, but obviously it's using um, some of the coax as the counterpoise. Uh, that was an idea that Ken gave me. I built that one. Yeah. And that's what I, I use 29 foot uh, with a 17 foot, um, uh, counterpoise for using my kx3 in the field and i actually connect it right directly to the radio uh with a banana with a banana plug splitter that connects to the bnc on the radio and then i feed i hang the one end from my third my seven meter fishing pole and i lay the other portion on the ground or stretch it out and that works with the tuner that's in that radio on 40 through 10 uh, six meters actually just fine yeah, I have, I have to have to use a, a, an ATU on mine, but it, it, it tunes good sort of forty through to ten. It's it's quite good. Uh, you know, I can tune it on on those bands. It's it's not bad at all, really. Yeah, the the one of the most popular antennas right now, as far as advertisements and hype goes, is the um, NFED. The thing that most people don't realize is there's two types of NFEDs. There's NFED half-wave antennas and NFED, NFED random length antennas. In one, you're trying to get a resonant antenna based on the length and the impedance matching you do. On the other one, you're looking for an antenna that's not resonant, and you're going to use the tuner to adjust it. Uh, there was a really good talk by uh, W... I'm sorry, that's not his call sign. What is it? Oh, one second here, I'll find it. Um, I'm part of a group called Rat Pack. I might have mentioned this before. That's Dennis and I 
knew each other from ThratPack.us, and they do uh, presentations every Wednesday and Thursday at, uh, it's right now they're on 0, 100 Zulu, so it's in the middle of your night, of course, but they're all recorded. And they have over 370 of these recordings. They just had one not too long ago by a gentleman who uh, does a really good talk on NFED antennas. If I can find it here. Uh, where is it? It's uh, Steve Dick, K1RF. I'll put the link to the video in the chat. It's a one-hour video. He actually did a presentation for this group, but he also did a presentation for our local club. Uh, I can't get this. Let me fix this link. It's not right. I think that's the right link. Let me check it to make sure it's working. But he talks a lot about uh, the. F oh, let me share the screen first. <laughs> Built wave is a resonant antenna. What background? So he has a presentation on infed antennas, and he goes into a lot about making the matching coils, the unums, the balans, etc., choking cables, etc. different ferrite materials. He doesn't have the best speaking voice, so it's sometimes a little bit difficult to hear him, but he has a lot of very good information. And I put the link in the chat. But that is a very popular antenna. The AWRL offers a kit here in the US that's made for them. Um, and it's not a very difficult antenna to build. There's also some commercial ones available. My antenna is the name of one of the commercial ones. They have the EH, uh, and they have NFED dipoles. They have the EFH, uh, what's the number on it? EHF 8010, which I have one. I've used it. They're a little bit expensive, I think, for what they do, but they do work well. Um, they have a matching unit and then a long wire. The wire is long, so you're going to need to put, put 130 feet up into the air, so it's not short. Uh, but they do work on 80 meters and up. Uh, there's also one from MFJ that's a little less expensive. It's an NFED half wave. This is, they have two different power versions. This is the low power version. It's only 89 bucks, 10 through 10, uh, 40 through 10. It says it does not need an antenna tuner, but I find that an antenna tuner is extremely helpful and it doesn't resonate all across the bands. They also have another version that covers 80 and they also have a version that's a higher power uh, level. This is the same, uh, this is the 8010 low power version, 300 watt version. So it's it's a, around $100. I've used these in the field, they work well. I wouldn't, I'd, I've never had one up permanently. I've only put them up temporarily. Other questions? Have you ever <clears throat> tried on the long wires to loose coil the far end of it in order to get the 130 feet into 50 feet or whatever some people say it works other people say yeah you kill the whole aerial doing it that way i i've zigzagged them to get it into a smaller space uh i've i've not really coiled up the wire to do it one of the things i found on on them sometimes is you can shorten an antenna just by coiling it up and you don't have to actually 
trim it to cut it uh, so you can you can roll up the end somewhat and get effect of shorting, shortening the length slightly so sometimes with my 27 foot random length when I'm using it in the field I will take a pen and wrap a little bit around there to shorten it up a little bit and that'll make a difference on letting it tune up with the tuner or not thanks mm -hmm. yes Adriana yeah, we are using NFET half waves on several um, several um, devices. Uh, we have one NFET half wave with a coil, which um, uh, makes possible uh, to uh, stretch it in our very very short garden. We have um, nearly about I think eight meters in the length, and um, this with this coil, it's possible to have an NFET half wave for twenty and uh, 40 meters, which wouldn't be possible uh, otherwise. And yes. uh, for portable uh, use, um, we are using, uh, especially I'm using um, the uh, 1 to 49 um, from the QRP uh, guys and with a several, um, with a diverse um, a length of uh, antenna wires and um, from this is very handy. This is quite. This works quite well, and uh, we also have a very good uh, experiences with the Rybakov antenna, which is which is uh, quite a random. Uh, which is multi. Yes, and I actually turned the camera off for a second because I went across the room to grab one of the QRP guys. Yeah. Little yeah. uh. These little exactly. things on the bottom are just hooks that I have to hang things with, but it's a very simple. Mm -hmm. You put the length of wire you need on here, and you yeah. use this and very simple little kit. They have another one that has a built-in antenna tuner on it. It has a, a, a capacitance antenna tuner. Let me grab that one. Now, you can see this meets yeah. category number two because it's still in the package it hasn't been assembled yet <laughs> but it has you can see the capacitor right here the variable capacitor and i haven't put this one together yet but this is a project to be put together and it's been sitting here since september so i still haven't got it put together but yes this is a category number two still in the package but it has an antenna tuner let me bring that up on the website so you can see it so this would be interesting uh, if you had assembled it, it, it works. We have uh, such um, such an NFET um, with, a, with this tuner. Uh, we thought it might be quite handy for portable use. And uh, I don't know what the fault is, but it doesn't work. You can tune it, uh, and uh, then you have to switch from tune to work. And when you uh, put it uh, to the work position, it doesn't work. I don't know. Uh, Put us aside. So it might be interesting if we uh, see each other um, next time uh, to know if uh, yours would work. Yes, and I'm trying to find it here, and I'm not finding it on their website. This is uh, this is their website right here. This this one's the forty. Let's see here. This is it. So this is. Uh, one of the antenna tuner bones right here. Mm -hmm. And there's also another one. This is the one I have. Yeah. And I haven't put it together yet. Yeah, I think this is the version we have, but there might be a problem uh, which uh, was in the assembling. Uh, we bought it assembled, but I think uh, we bought uh, a Chinese clone, <laughs> and uh, might might be uh, that there is something in the assembling wrong. Yeah, and they they use it. They suggest you create a wire with two traps in it, and mm -hmm. uh, then use this. So I've I've got a put this together and play with it i i ordered this from them and the order got lost in shipping so they had to reship everything to me so it it came after my planned outing during the summertime and i haven't got around to assembling it yet so i'm going to use that as my excuse but 
I won't have that excuse much longer because it's getting warm and it's time to get it to mm -hmm. assembled and get it out in the field. So I will try and get this up and running by summertime here to get to give it a try. But uh, I, I, I because I operate almost all QRP, it makes it convenient to buy inexpensive things like this and try them out. Uh, you know, I, uh, you can't do this with a hundred watts. So uh, oh. just interesting to do. But uh, it's the site again is QRP guys is the site put the link in the chat yeah, over here of course in the uk we've got soda beans that um mm -hmm. were set up to to supply bits and pieces and kits and i i just went to grab um this which is their nfed half wave tuner mount call it the mountain tuner for 40 <laughs> meters to 17 uh that is very small um, mm -hmm. it's very very easy to assemble mm -hmm. uh, with the bnc socket at the bottom of it i know as well that dx engineering was selling these at one stage i think Anthony. yes they are yes they, they are might even, um, might even be still doing it but um that that works very well the other thing i'd recommend is uh we've got uh, kanga kits has started off and this is they produce this as a kit as well and this this is a an atu um for um use out in the field you can see how i mean that, that's it next to my hand so you can yeah. see how small it is it's a really small antenna tuner mm -hmm. i mean you can't as as anthony says the delight of these things it uses those little polyvarican capacitors in there so you can't put more than about 10 watts through it without some uh, without it not working uh, but mm -hmm. for a for a, a small portable operation running qrp it's it's effectively a little single coil Z match is what it is. They call it a um, pocket trans match, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you adjust it, you know, for maximum signal strength that you can receive and then use the other uh, tuner to uh, bring it to resonance. But it, that works extremely as well. Been been very impressed with that. But, you know, those of us that go and play with stuff portable, I don't know if that's your experience, Anthony. Um, I, I try and not take things like this because as soon as you start taking more bits you know i've then got to find another lead to go from the atu into back of the radio and so on and yes. you know, you, you're ending up with all these bits you're wicking out of bags uh, when you're as i was this afternoon sitting on the the top of a windy field somewhere um and uh, it's it's not the it's not the easiest thing and i think the the advice of trying to keep things as simple as possible is is pretty good advice when we come to antennas really yeah and that's what that's one of my complaints about the icom 705 i really like yeah. the radio yeah. but i'm so spoiled by my elecraft kx2 with the antenna tuner that it'll match pretty much anything so you know i go back and forth the the k the i the ic5705 has a lot more features it has the band scope it has all those things but then it doesn't have the antenna tuner so if i'm using that with a non-resident antenna i need a separate antenna tuner with me uh whereas if i'm using my kx2 i basically have it in a little package with a length of wire and I can go out and operate and know that I'll be able to get a match with it, you know, at least on most of the bands that I'm going to be operating on. So it is, it, it does become complicated when your antenna system has multiple components because it's easier to do at home. But if you're trying to do it in the field, it gets, yeah. it gets complicated very quickly. Yeah. Um, that's why one of the things I do with my, uh, operations is let me get that slide here again as you can see my portable operations here this is my my main field kit here and this is a kx3 uh in a box i have a better shot of that here this is the portable presentation Of course, when I do this, that means I'm not going to find it. Okay. Of course, I didn't find it when I did that, but I do have a presentation on. Let me get that presentation up.
so this is my rapid deploy go box. I flip the lid up, pull the front off, and I'm ready to operate my KX3. And it's made from a tackle box. There's also a set of toolboxes available from a number of discount suppliers that are available. And the nice thing is you end up with all these little project boxes to use also. But here's the radio and the front cut snaps off and the top opens up. I have a battery in there. I connect the antenna directly to the side of it with one of these little splitters. I've tried different lengths. I've tried 26 foot, 27 foot, 29 foot. They all sort of work. I've also made longer ones that work down on 80. Um, but again, you just pick the non-resident wire lengths. And as I said before, sometimes I'll use a pen and sort of shorten this a little bit by wrapping it around a pen down at the base here if I can't get it to tune on a specific frequency. Okay, anyone else got a, a question or comment to, to Anthony? I, I was just very quickly going to um, kind of do a bit of a sales pitch, really, for the RSGB on two books that they've got out. Um, let me just uh, share my screen and show them to you. Okay, there are... Two, two books. The most recent one they've got out is uh, is this one, the Antenna Notebook, um, and uh, it's it's I, mine arrived a couple of days ago. It is superb. I mean, it's a collection. It's been edited by Lorna, two e zero P O I, in which she's going to come and talk about this um, in um, a few weeks' time at the club. But she goes through a pile of different antennas, loop antennas, horizontal, vertical, and she's really compiled um, ideas from all kinds of publications, you know, from QST, from RAGCOM, from uh, the um, uh, QRP um, club, Sprat, and so on, and um, and presents them in one book. And that, so it's got some fantastic stuff in it. Uh, and I know that's going to give me lots of uh, lots of ideas. The other very good book, if and this has been out a, a little while, it came out um, a few years ago, is called uh, Portable Antennas for Everyone. And again, lots of different ideas in that. This came out four years ago, 2020, written by Steve Telenius Lowe, PJ4DX. Uh, he's he's compiled this and, and presented all the information here. Uh, but again, that's got some absolutely superb information in it. So... If people here are looking for reading material, I mean, I've got no idea for Mike and Adriana and, and Jeff in Germany or even um, uh, for you, Anthony, in the States, how easy and cheap it is to get these. I know the portable antennas one is definitely available in the Kindle version. I don't think the antenna notebook is at the moment, so it's only a, a physical copy of it. But they, they are extremely good. I really would... Um, really would uh, recommend the these books as things to dip in and out of really i've actually have i actually have the, the portable antennas when the second book you showed yeah yeah do you agree it's a really useful book yes. isn't it it's got some fantastic yes, it ideas is. in it and it reminds me ken i promised to uh, copy some of the pages on it which i haven't done yet and uh, i'm 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 going to leave it in, in the shack here so that it's next to the computer, and I'll I'll do it for you, and uh, send them across for an antenna you wanted to uh, to put together. The RSGB has a broken link on their website for the antenna notebook. When you go there, they completely messed up the URL. Oh dear! So it goes out to a Google something cat catalog instead of catalog. I'm not sure what they did, but they definitely did not put the right link in there. Yeah, that's very interesting the way they, I see what they did. They have the wrong, <laughs> they have the wrong link in there. You found the description of the book now? Yes, I found the description of the book on their website, but they had the wrong link on their, oh, okay. yeah. on their, here's, here's the uh, web page and it's got the wrong link.
See, when you click on it, it goes out to a 404 error. Oh, and they yeah, obviously yeah. have the catalog. Yeah. They also obviously have the, the, the link wrong because it goes to Google instead of RSGB. Yeah. Whereas all the other links go out to RSG. Well, nope, they got that one broken too. Maybe it's, maybe I can't access it from the U.S., but I don't know. Uh, yeah, let me have a look. So you were going, you were going from the What's New page, were you? Yeah. Yes. So, Actually, you know, I was on the uh, books and general books section. Okay. General books, and then. Then I scrolled down to the new products part of that. Sellers, new products. Okay, let me click on the answer of the notebook. Yeah, that's it. Worked. That works absolutely perfectly for me. That's strange. So it must be something about. To me, it takes me to a. Let me try it on a different browser. Could be browser specific. Yeah, I use uh, the browser I'm using to go into it is on the Avast browser. I used Avast one for my. Um, okay, let me go there via a Firefox browser. So there's something that's not working in my browser on okay. that particular one. I'm not sure what, but I I was able to bring it up. That is strange. But I did get it. Yeah, it's it, very good. And Lorna, who's the editor of it, is uh, is coming to talk at the club about this um, in a few weeks' time. So um, she's going to give a for those people here tonight. She's going to give a bit of a introduction to how she got into amateur radio as a journalist. And yeah, I've just tried it in my other browser. I've tried it in my Google browser, Anson. It's working. Perfectly in Google and in there's the got to be something on my end. There's either one of the, either an ad blocker or something that's blocking it on yeah. my end. Yeah. Because it's like that for all the books there. It's, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah, I just made a note to contact her to tell her there was broken links on the books. It's not. It's, yeah, for some reason it's just. It might be something on my browser. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. Anyway, but uh, yeah. So, so sorry to dip into uh, to hijack Anthony's thing and and sell a couple of RSGB books, but they uh, they really are both very good. Lots of really good ideas in there. And I mean, the biggest takeaway, Anthony, that I get from what you've told us again tonight, and this is the great thing about antennas, is that we can all play with them and try things out, can't we? And particularly yes. if it just involves a bit of wire uh, and some feeder um, and a bit of time. And um, we, we can all try out what works and what doesn't work for us in the space we've got available. You know, I, when I work with new, with new hams a lot of times, they'll ask me, which radio should I buy? Which antenna should I buy? And I have to explain to them the thing about amateur radio is if you really get into it, you're not going to just have one radio and you're not just going to have one antenna over your life of your ham radio career. They're worried about the antenna. They think they're buying the antenna that they're going to be using for the rest of their, their time as a ham. And I have to warn them that that's probably not the case. <laughs> it's one of those dirty little secrets of amateur radio. The, the stack of, you know, if you ask me how many transceivers are in my house, I have no idea. <laughs> And how many antennas have you used since you became a radio home? <laughs> many. But, you know, the funny thing is I still have in my in my garden in the back, lying on the ground, the original 18-foot support pole that I used when I lived in my apartment that I haven't used since I moved out of there 40, let's see, what was it, 19, 37 years ago. So it's been <laughs> laying there waiting for another project. You never, you know, that's the other thing too, is you never throw away aluminum when you're a ham because you're always assuming you'll use it for yet another project. No, I'll go a step further than that, Anthony. You never throw away anything as a ham because you're yes. going to use it for another project. Yes, that is, that is definitely the case. 
we've we've came to a solution when we have our our rallies what we do is we have a table a couple tables we put out and there's a big there's three big signs that says find what you want take what you need leave what it's worth and we have a bin there for you to put your money in and we've told everyone in the club you know we i know you can't throw that in the garbage but you can throw it in the box to bring to the rally and so they do that and that we get hundreds of dollars each year from people just you know grabbing the junk that everyone brought in and returning it to their junk. <laughs> That's a very good idea because we do a tabletop sale over in the Denverdale Pie Hall and um, uh, we've taken stuff and I've said to people when they're looking at bits we've been given from people or yes. um, families of silent keys have given to us and, you know, there are some wonderful things in there and people say, how much do you want for that? And I say, you know, just give what you think it's worth. And, um, you know, people give us whatever it is, you know, one or two pounds or something. Um, a couple of, you know, several times we've just given things away. Not sure whether this is working, but if you want to take it away, please be our guest and yes. have a play with it if it's going to be useful to you. And I, I think that's, I think we should do more of that, really. It's a good idea. I like a notice, I like a notice that you've suggested, though, on it that says, you know, bring us something, leave us something, take it away. <laughs> And if you want to pay, then pay what you think you want to give. And, and what happens is people at the Hamfest rally, they take their stuff that they're trying to sell. And if they, they're ready to give up on something, they'll bring it up and put it on the table and give it to us. So we had to make up rules about what you can give us. We don't take any CRTs. We don't take any liquids. <laughs> because sometime, one time we had someone come up and bring a big, a big five-gallon bucket of transformer oil that he wanted to get rid of. It's like, no, no liquids, no CRTs, no printers. Uh, we have certain things you're not allowed to add to the table because we know what will happen. We'll have to dispose of them. No, nothing alive either, but we've had not had anyone try and give us anything that's alive yet. But definitely no liquids. Yeah. Well, Anthony, thank you very much indeed for coming back again this evening and uh, giving a great talk. And I know we've got we've got some of our members uh, meet up in a pub on the last Wednesday of the month in uh, Huddersfield. So I know they're going to be looking at this on. Uh, on video tomorrow and from there from onwards so um you, you'll have a lot of people picking up your your talk tonight and this discussion so well, can, I, can i thank you again for coming along i need to share one more thing real quick with you because because you do zoom meetings you need to know about the newest zoom feature that's out there i was doing a presentation on zoom to a group not amateur radio related but they were a number of people in this group and so i have this thing this presentation on Zoom, and one of the things in here is probably the best new Zoom feature. So you know about the, if, if you've been using Zoom for a while, you know that they changed the share screen features to have this new capability of having someone in the screen and all these different things. Yeah. But you might not realize the, the most useful new feature, and that's the share pie screen. You click down there and you can share pie with all the participants that are there. <laughs> <laughs> I do all these talks for different groups and they usually have refreshments while I'm talking. So I came up with this fake share pie button for their <laughs> Zoom screen. That makes you the most popular speaker ever if you can do that. <laughs> yes, if I could do that. You know, we have one button for coffee, one button for pie, and then someone else wanted a cake button too. So I guess... Uh, <laughs> That would make it very helpful. But thank you very much for the opportunity. It's been great. Love chatting with you guys. Right. Thank you very much, Anthony. Good to see you. And, uh, I'm going to say going to say good evening as well to uh, uh, people who are going to be watching this on YouTube. And thank you for coming along and uh, supporting us uh, through there. Uh, just to say, we're now up to 800 subscribers on our YouTube channel. For a small club, we've got just under 50 members of our club. That's... Uh, you know, a fantastic uh, wide audience that are dipping in and out of what we're up to, which is great news. 73, everyone.